So, do we want to start with the corset or do we just want to start with the heel? The heel is probably the quickest thing. Because the corset has four sides that I need to get sewn up and that could take a while. So. Cat in Phoenix working on crochet motifs. Ooh. I don't really know what the heel is called. It's it's just a basic heel. <laughs> uh, oh, great counting. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, 16, there's 32 stitches across here. So what I usually do, well, let's make sure two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So yeah, I've got Ninja Zada from Edmonton. I am very sorry to hear that you had snow this morning. It was rather chilly here in Calgary today, or at least this morning when I first got up and I asked I asked the Googs, which I am not going to say too much about because there is a Google puck here in the office. Uh, I asked the Googs what was the uh, weather like and I got told it was 7 degrees Celsius here in Calgary and uh, when I mentioned, ooh, it's cooled down, the husbies told me that it had snowed last night in Edmonton, so I'm very sorry to hear that. Heel flap. Heel flap. Okay, so I am using the pattern Hermione's Everyday Socks by Erica Luter. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. And it is a dead simple sock. It's been... Uh, Basically, it's a four row pattern in which, uh, with, with a <laughs> four row pattern with a four stitch pattern inside it. So it's like knit, purl, knit, knit, and then a row of knits, and then knit three, purl one, and repeat around, and then knit one row. So I've done that all the way up and as you can see it gives this really beautiful nubbly texture. I'll hold this up here because you can see the you can see the color a little bit better on the Logitech uh, camera. It's somewhere between the two. It's actually a really nice pinky peach color. And so as a result, I'm working this over a grand total of 64 stitches, 32 per side. And so now I've stopped after one of our purling rows because when I'm done and I'm going all the way around after doing the flap, there will be a full row of just knit stitch, which is just the way that I like to do things so that I don't have to worry about which pattern I'm going to be starting with. Anyhow, uh, let's see here. So what I usually do is I get halfway through and then usually like to count so that there's 12 over here and that will be the beginning part of my stitch. So I've got 16, 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, wait a second here, 2, 4, 8, 10, 12, so knit, and then I knit two together, come on, and then knit one. So that gives me 12 over here and what I want to do is work on this side until I've got 12 remaining over here. So turn her around. Slip the first one. 
And then one, two, three, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I am going to slip, slip. I don't know whether you can see this. Transfer that back and purl through the back loops. I'll show that again in just a minute or two. And then purl one. Turn her around. So now I've got 12 here. I've got 12 here on this side of the gap. And then in the middle of the gap, I've got two, four, six stitches. Let's see here. 10 degrees the whole day, too cold for me. And for me, 24 degrees in Sao Paulo, Brazil is supposed to be winter here. <laughs> uh, warm in Toronto, had to share. Uh, I've been holding off on the whole shaving thing. I know I have to do it at some point. And yes, 24 degrees would be a nice summer day. Um, it was somewhere around 23 or 24 a couple of days ago, and we were just sweltering up on the second floor of the house. I was rather glad to be down here. Okay, slip the first stitch, knit across until one before, I'm out, one before the gap. And I will just knit two together. So what was before the gap and what's after the gap, knit two together. Knit one. And now I've got two, four, six, eight, ten on this side. And we want to just even it up. So purl back across until you're one before the gap. There we go, one before the gap. I don't know how well that comes across on that cam. I wish I had a camera with a zoom. I, I would actually zoom it in for this. So we're going to slip, and then slip the next stitch, transfer them back over to the left hand needle, and purl through the back loops, and purl one. And then it's lather, rinse, repeat. So slip one, knit across to one before the gap. Knit two together, knit one. Slip the, first, slip the first stitch and purl back until you're one before the gap. Slip, slip, transfer, purl through the back loops, purl one. The funny thing is that I am pretty sure there are a couple of people who are watching this who are just, just here for the whole slow sock making movement. Apparently that was, that was a big thing at one point, was um, watching people do things like knitting in real time because it's soothing. It's like, I guess, watching streams of people doing things like uh, baking in real time <laughs> because it's it's a soothing exercise to do. So what is everybody else working on today?
procrastinating on cleaning. I've been there. I have a whole sink full of stuff that I'm procrastinating on washing right now. Makes me feel like I've got company. I also know that feeling. That, that's why I've got Twitch. <laughs> Usually somewhere in the middle of the night. Oops. Somewhere, somewhere around like... I keep bumping that, sorry. Somewhere around 10 or 11 o'clock at night when most of our friends have gone to sleep and aren't playing games or what have you, is I'll turn on Twitch and find a crafting stream and just sort of lurk and listen. Turning a heel is hard. I I don't know. I think it's all just practice, really. I've had those times where I thought that I had done the heel. Like, I thought that I had uh, gotten most of it done, and then I get distracted. And I realize that um, I've tried to turn the heel twice. <laughs> so I'll wind up with a double heel and have to tink back. should put laundry in but I'll sew instead that that's fair only tidying today well that is nice at some point I'd like to be at the just tidying phase the husbeast has got the week off so he's he's been doing things like getting caught up with any kind of Bureau bureaucratic things. We just had tax season here in Canada, so he's getting caught up with tax season stuff and like the fallout from it. <laughs> and um, he has a couple of people who keep texting him for, for stuff, so he's doing that and playing some video games since he doesn't have to go into the office. And I don't hear the cat singing the song of her people anymore, so I have a feeling that he inter intervened with uh, Princess Furry Pants. Okay. So we managed, I'm just going to tink back here for a moment, we managed to get to the end, so you'll notice that I've got this was Nope, that was one over here. Okay. So we had the last stitch on the needle, and then we had two over here, which you can see we've also got two over here. Don't know how well that shows up. Anyhow, just like we've done all the way through, knit two together. And then knit one. We don't have anything left on here. I tend to not let go because otherwise it's just going to flop all over the place and this is already in a nice curve. So, oh, Princess Fuzzy Pants is still singing the song of her people. Uh, so, see, now I've got, uh, got the needle in my hand and I can just do my slip one and purl all the way across till that uh, one stitch before the gap. And it is at this point that I realized that I turned the heel, but I didn't put in the heel flap. <sighs> Thinking back.
Oh, this is going to take a while. see here what are people saying definitely can't put my knitting down in the middle of the middle of the heel I have to do the whole thing in one sitting I'll even warn my husband I'm starting a heel don't talk to me <laughs> I get distracted easily as you might have noticed you're not distracting me I'm distracting myself I got a little too ahead of the game. But in the meantime, you get to see me tinking back a whole bunch of things. So <laughs> I guess that makes it educational. Can you tink back an entire heel? Why, yes. Yes, you can. Don't drop stitches. Yes, some, but somebody mentioned the heel flap. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I went, of course I've got a heel flap. But at least now some of you who have never done a heel flap or never done a heel turn before now know that the actual turning of the heel takes less than half an hour. <laughs> Once you get going, it's the heel flap that takes all of the, all of the extra brain cells. Uh, hello, Dave. Dude is getting over his like, like for, dislike for Benjamins. Okay, what have we got there? Boom. Here we go. Turn her around, tink back. <sighs> Is anybody else hearing the music in the background or am I the only one who's got that going for them right now? Can't hear the music. I'm gonna try turn. Well, I don't even know if it's coming through. Uh, you're gonna hear some mouse clicking. Mm, that's not the right one. Properties. I'll use the speakers. Turn that up and see if we can hear anything. Let me know if you can hear that. And again, headphone. Let's see. Just sitting here weaving a scarf. Weaving a scarf is cool.
I have a cousin by marriage who is a weaver and they make some really, really lovely scarves. And I spun up a bunch of yarn for the husbeast to make a scarf for him a few years ago now. And because it's spun up so fine, I haven't actually gotten around to knitting him anything out of it. Which the, um, the Victorian mystery pattern that I did the video on last year would actually, it would actually make a really good scarf for him. But I've considered handing the yarn over to the cousin by marriage and see if they'd be willing to use it to weave him a scarf. So that's something that I may have to ask when they have some time. No music except the singing cat. <laughs> <laughs> she she was going on for quite a while there, yeah. And Dave tells me he can hear it now. Good. Is Let me know if it's too loud or if it needs to uh, go a little bit louder. I don't want to bust anybody's eardrums. I figured that since I have, since I've got epidemic sound, I might as well use it. So I'm actually on their, I'm on their YouTube station because it's easier to have them select the music rather than me download a whole bunch of tracks. And I'm on their 10 hours of lo-fi hip hop marathon playlist and I'm I'm actually quite enjoying it. It's something that I probably wouldn't have probably something that I wouldn't have chosen. Sounds like the lo-fi I listen to while working on finals. Yeah. Yeah. A few years ago, one of my relatives posted on Facebook about how once you get to a certain age, you stop listening to new music. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, the lo-fi hip-hop. Well, okay, I, I am Generation X, and I grew up in a... I had, I had my most uh, formative teenage years in a fairly rural area adjacent to our nation's capital. Which, despite what some think is not Toronto, but Ottawa, which in some ways is not as liberal as Toronto and in other ways is more so. Uh, but, but, I grew up with community radio and community radio is all of, none of the music that will ever offend you and all of the music that will appeal to everyone from say age eight to age 95 so pop a little rock usually classic rock um yeah 
And because I didn't have cable TV, I couldn't watch much music, which is Canada is or was Canada's version of uh, MTV, which at the time was actually playing music and not reality television because reality TV didn't really exist back then and uh, yeah um, I listened to a lot of Brian Adams and Corey Hart and counted myself really lucky when I could hear you know something that came in from Europe so the Dr. Demento show was actually an event <laughs> So a lot of my adult years has been rediscovering music of the 80s that I didn't get exposed to in the 80s and enjoying it. Music of the 90s was uh, moved from Yellowknife. So I lived just outside of Ottawa until about 91, 92. And then I moved up to Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories where again, community radio. And there I moved to Toronto. And Toronto was a bit of an experience. I mean, first time I heard Nine Inch Nails closer on the radio was like, oh my God, you can play that on the radio? Mariana says, I love Brian Adams. Well, I, en I enjoyed his first tape. I think his, his first tape was uh, one of my very first adult cassettes. Adult. And uh, then it just got overplayed because in Canada we have something called Canadian content. And you need to have a certain amount of CanCon on the radio. It's one of the ways that... Oh, hey, I'm on my way back. Yay. It's, it's one of the ways... And so I'm just going <laughs> to... So that was the end of uh, the tinking. I'm just going to go right to the end of the heel flap. Because in Canada, the way that they try to uh, promote Canadian bands and Canadian artists and thus keep Canadian culture sort of at the forefront of the Canadian experience, you have to have a certain amount of Canadian acts on your radio and your TV. Oops. I've got a Discord window that is showing. There we go. And so for a while there in the 1980s, if you were tuning into any kind of radio station, you'd hear a lot of the same artists over and over and over and over. It's why anybody who remembers growing up in the 70s and 80s in Canada can, can probably uh, sing you a few songs by the Guess Who because their, their music got a lot of airplay. And Anne Murray, she was big. Uh, Buffy St. Clair. Um. Okay, but the upshot of where I was going with that is 
rather than being stuck only working with music that I grew up with, I've been trying to expand my uh, listening and a lot of a lot of YouTube has actually been helping with that because I watch a lot of guys like Adam Neely and Polyphonic who talk about older music, but also talk about new stuff like jazz. Um, Neely is big into the New York jazz scene. Um, and he'll go into things like lo-fi and other newer genres. So I'm learning a real appreciation for some of these things. Yeah. So for those of you new to the heel flap, what you basically do I'm just gonna okay we're right back at baiting okay so the anatomy of the heel flap the heel flap is the part of the heel that goes, that actually wraps directly around the back of your heel. So it's that part at the back of your shoe that's kind of curved, if that makes sense. Give me one more. We are going to just chatting. Here we go. This is my size 9, 10 slipper. <laughs> the heel flap is this section here. Apparently a friend of mine has entered World of Warcraft. I don't know whether you guys heard that. So what we are working on right now is this section here on a sock. The actual turning of the heel deals with this section in here. So what we've been doing is heading down this way, and now we want to do this part, and then we'll do something called the heel turn and a gusset, a gusset to tie them all together. If we'll go back to the chat interface while I put my slipper back on. Because my basement, it do be cold. Oof. Oh. Pardon me. I think I pulled something there. Sandra, I'm fascinated with socks knitted on Magic Loop. I learned it with five separate needles and that's what I usually do. It's not a matter of being dumb. It's just a matter of being comfortable with it. I find, I, I am actually, uh, I'm a little jealous of your ability to handle five needles at once because I can't. I ha I wind up with things just flying all over the place. And this way, I've got a tether. <laughs> I, ha I have actually had to go chasing after a knitting needle on a bus. It was not pleasant. The other patrons wondered what the heck was wrong. Um, but uh, it's not a matter of being dumb or smart. It's just a matter of practicing and finding a way to do things that is comfortable. Because it could be you were using the wrong size of cable. You might have been using too short a cable or too long a cable. You might have been trying to do two socks at once, which I find is just ridiculously inefficient. <laughs> because I spend more time trying to wrangle. Pardon me, I'm going to cough.
Hope nobody heard that. I don't want to blow out your eardrums. But um, no, I find two at a time on uh, one circular needle highly efficient because I spend most of my time trying to figure out how to knit that second sock without having the other sock flapping around all over the place and it, it drives me nuts. So definitely, if you want to try doing the one sock at a time on one circular needle magic loop, definitely try at least a 32 inch cable, cable needle, set of needles. Um, gonna cough again. It's my own house. I don't have to worry about trying to tuck my head into my arm. But the anatomy of the heel flap. I'm going, what I want to do is basically do the same amount of rows, but this way. So I've got stitches, I've got 32 stitches on the needle. I want to do at least 32 rows. <clears throat> at least 32 rows and I want to alternate between plain knitting or a knit one slip one at least that's the way that I do it I usually use a knit one slip one sometimes I do a knit all the way across knit one slip one knit all the way across slip one knit one which I believe is called an eye of partridge Heel. And the reasoning behind that is to try and make that heel as strong as you can. I mean, you can you can actually uh, knit with a little bit of thread in there, which will give it a little bit more stability and a little bit more strength. Some yarn companies give you a matching thread or bit of nylon to go with the colors that you're working with and that's mainly if you're dealing with making socks for people who are prone for blowing out the heel. I find that it's not usually the back of the heel where my folks have problems. My recipients usually have problems with the, someplace on the area of the heel turn or someplace near the toes but not generally at the back of the heel flap itself. Why has he kept... Mm. I'm sorry if you keep hearing that sort of whistling or tweeting noise. Uh, it's a alert from one of my friends who keeps entering World of Warcraft. It's one of the drawbacks behind... Um, it's one of the drawbacks of having Discord up. See here. Have to scroll back a little bit. Wow. <clears throat> I remember that I introduced my parents to a lot of the metal bands I like by locking myself in my room and screaming along to them like it's 2006 and no mom, it's not a face, this is who I am. I shudder to think of some of the music that I put on repeat and sang along to when I was a teenager because I don't know if anybody else did this but I I remember the CD single and I can remember sticking it on in the background and just the same three songs going over and over and over again and I would have tuned out because I was writing a novel or something and I can remember getting a knock on my bedroom door more than once from my parents saying could you please choose something else we're getting sick and tired of the same three songs at least at least they didn't um, say anything about the subject matter of the songs Let's see hello Kathy and accidentally Steve from Ottawa and hello Alice in Winterpeg 
dealing with the multiple balls for two at a time is a nightmare. Yes, there's also the having to juggle two balls of yarn. And one of the reasons why I don't... One of the things I used to do was to try and very meticulously uh, use a scale to put to, to weigh out half the ball and I would separate them out and I would even use two sets of needles and try to get caught up so I'd work one sock all the way up to the heel and then the second sock all the way up to the heel and then do a heel flap on each and then do a heel turn on each so basically doing two at a time without the actual two at a time and uh yeah that was not good that was not good. You you wind up, instead of having one ball of leftover yarn, you wind up with two little balls of leftover yarn <laughs> that you have to find a place to, uh, to store them until you decide to do some sort of a stash buster <laughs> later on down the line. Plus, they also get tangled. Tangled balls of yarn are not pleasant. Hello, forced to make this bloody account. Dental floss for my hubby's boot socks. I take it that's your reinforcing thread? <laughs> and Sandra's just, just realized you can do two at a time on Magic Loop. Yes, <laughs> yes you can. You get a long enough cable, cable on your... Uh, on your uh, needle, you can you can do a lot of things. <laughs> Hello, Rebecca from Florida. Um, let's see here. Just finished a scarf and I'm on to starting a rug. That's cool. Now is it a hooked rug? Is it a woven rug? Is it a braided rug? A crocheted rug? Inquiring minds want to know. What sock technique would you say is easiest to learn? Um, I would probably say top down, plain knit two, purl two cuff for however many rounds you feel comfortable for. Some people, some people like me go up as far as 20 rounds of knit two, purl two. Some people just I had to work up to having the patience to do that. So some folks will uh, bail out around 10 rounds, which is perfectly fine. Five is probably too few. And then you knit a cuff. Easiest one to do is just straight, straight stock knit. Just knit around for about, until you've got about seven inches total. And... Uh, do a plain ordinary heel turn and yeah coughing Calgary is a rather dry place and as a former smoker, if I talk for too long, I tend to uh, get the coughs, so I apologize. Huh. But, let's see here. Toe-up socks are, are cool. It's a matter of wrapping your head around the short rows for your um, toes 
and for your heels if you choose to do a short row heel. I've been known to do toe up socks, but they're not my first choice. But they're definitely not too terribly difficult. Uh, let's see. Must have learned differently. I start from the center of the skein so it doesn't unravel while I work. I... I have a problem with... Um, starting from the center of the skein mostly because you wind up with like a little shell so if if you're doing socks two at a time from the same ball you can have you know a strand that comes from the outside like i'm using here which i find is easiest to it, if everything starts to get crimped up because some people the way that they knit it'll start uh, looping back on itself what you can do is you can um, also pull from the center and use a center pull ball and just out from there. And for those people who are doing two at a time, you can take a strand from the outside and a strand from the inside and you can knit that way. But I find that they tend to get tangled up against each other and then you have to somehow manage to hold on to them while somehow you let each sock <laughs> if if you're using two uh sets of needles let each sock twirl out their length like twirl out the kink on their own <laughs> or if it's one sock on two uh if it's two socks on one long needle you're kind of sunk you have to try and get the ball to do the turning around. So you have to kind of find a way to secure both ends of the ball and let the ball do the twirling around. And it's just... Uh, I, I found it really, really frustrating. So... One sock at a time. One set of needles. Going from the outside. Because otherwise, as I said, I wind up with like this little shell that you then have to rewind anyways. And it kind of drives me nuts to have to do that. Otherwise, you wind up with like this uh, weird mess at the bottom of wherever you're storing your, um, your leftovers. And I'd rather not deal with that. Might just be me. I have been known to reskein old balls of yarn, so depends on where you're storing them and how compact you need everything to be. Uh, that needs to be boom. Bata Shoe Museum is doing a webinar tonight about 17th century fashion dolls. Starts at 7 p.m. Registration on their site. Is that 7 p.m. Eastern Time? Instead of using two balls of yarn, you could knit one sock from the inside and the other one from the outside of the ball. These are bun that, That's pretty much what I was saying, yeah. Yeah, Fanny's got it. I have not tried a fish lips kiss heel, I don't think. I just use a traditional old-fashioned heel that I can't remember where exactly I found it. ways to knit socks almost no one will knit them the same very true I 
I actually have a friend who does not do things the easy way. <laughs> and when she when when they saw that I was uh, knitting socks, they said, I want to knit socks too. And next thing I know, they were doing their very first pair of socks. They somehow went and I think figured out uh, the... I think it's one of the Judy's Magic toes or something like that. Or a figure eight toe or something. But they but they figured out how to do uh, their socks toe up for the very first time. And they went until on both socks they ran out of yarn. And they turned out to be like knee socks on them. And uh, yeah, they, they aren't so much as much of a sock knitter as I am. <laughs> They'd rather do hats. And I think it's probably because they... Uh, they wore themselves out doing the sock knitting. When I do one on the outside, one from the center, I put a ball cozy on. That could work. Most of the time when I use... I love the term ball bag. Most of the term when I use one of those, which is basically a little mesh bag that you can make out of leftover, leftover uh, fingering weight yarn. Um, I find that it usually doesn't like to uh, let me use from the outside of the ball. I usually have to go directly from the middle, which sometimes I do. I'm not going to lie, sometimes I do it. Most of the time, though, these days, I just use the outside of the ball. And yeah, I probably should switch up my heels every so often, but it's, it's really easy just to get into a groove and... Well, get into a groove and just because you know what you're doing and it's familiar to you, you just repeat it. For some people, for some people, sock knitting is an art and has to be an art. And for some people, it's practical. And I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I started off liking the uh, artistic aspect of it in that you could find patterns that would be as lacy as you wanted or as cabled as you wanted or what have you and after a while of trying to I guess pump out five or six pairs of socks per year that that was uh, one pair of socks per parent, so my parents, the husband's parents, a pair for the husband, hopefully a pair for me. And then if somebody in the family wanted a pair, uh, and, and I figured they'd appreciate them and I had the time, I would knit them a pair of socks. Nowadays, I generally ask them if I've got some extra time and I haven't knit them something and they seem to be receptive to it, they seem to be the kind of person to take care of it and not just go, oh, that's nice, and throw it in a pile in the corner. Um, I'll ask them what they'd like, whether they'd like a pair of socks, whether they'd like a scarf. I haven't done sweaters for any of the family because that's kind of a big ask. <clears throat> Mostly scarves, shawls, a couple of hats, a few pairs of mitts. Mitts are fun because I can do color work in mittens and I don't find that it... You don't need to worry about the stretch so much as you do with socks. I find that doing... Stranded color work on socks tends to make it so that the sock can't actually... You can't actually get the sock over the person's foot. 
though that just might be the way that I do things. Alice has a podcast. Woo. I will have to check out your podcast, Alice. Is it under the name Soxy Nana? Or is it under a different name? Move this back just a wee tad. Oh, hi. There we go. As everybody else gets motion sickness. Sandra says, I find sock knitting more relaxing than knitting jumpers or pullovers. I just finally finished a jumper and now I need to make some socks or else I will lose my mind. <laughs> yes. Sometimes socks are a great palette cleanser. Uh, one thing I need to get my hands on is the Knit More Girls Operation Sock Drawer because I've been listening to Jasmine and Gigi on and off for the past God knows how many years. And it would be kind of nice to be able to see their first written effort. Looks like they worked with quite a few talented sock designers, so it'd be really cool. Now, for anybody who is wondering, <clears throat> I usually, because I'm doing a uh, slip one, knit one across on the purl side, because, well, it's purling. Anything that makes the purling go a little bit faster. If you don't have to do as much purling on the purl side, good stuff. But I generally slip the last two stitches, because what I'm going to do is when I turn it around... Just let that flop for a moment. I'm just going to knit all of the stitches across. So rather than having, you know, too many knits across one side, I just slip that last stitch and then knit it on the way back. the end of the knit, turn it, don't let it lose track of your needle otherwise it'll just flop around and head back. Now one thing that you may notice, and I think the camera's picking up, is there's this kind of texture on the back and it's it's what gives the sock a little bit more thickness and, and stability, is you've got these little ridges every second row where you've done the slipping. And that is how you can count how many rows you've done because if you knit one and then you slip on the way back, well, that's two rows. So I've got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve rows done. Thirteen because I just knit across. So this will be my fourteenth row. This 
This is why I consider this sort of the simplicity and zen of sock knitting. <laughs> And I have to admit, the Hermione's Everyday Sock Pattern is really elegant, really dead simple. Even if you use your own, you know, heels or toes. The stitch pattern that they use for the leg and for the foot are actually really quite nice. Really dead simple. And for hand paint style yarn like this, it just, it's beautiful. Um, I've also had really good, um, it, it also has, has worked to great effect. There we go. Worked to great effect on, um, the crazy zauber ball i think it's called where it's it's kind of like a two-stranded spun yarn of two colorways that are long color changes i guess giving a kind of heathered effect I just bought a surprise package of sock wool. It sits here next to me and I lovingly look at it. I'm not caressing it yet. <laughs> so I take it you've opened the surprise package and it met with your uh, it met with your approval. You know, I wanted to put the overhead camera, I wanted to plug it in back there, but uh, for whatever reason, it didn't want to clear the top of my monitor. <laughs> So I will try that again for next time, maybe. And that way I won't have to worry about having El Bumperino over here. The colors are beautiful, awesome. Now, was, was this part of a swap that you were in, or was it a purchase that you made where they had basically a surprise? You, you spent a bit of money and they sent you a surprise skate? Sort of like a grab bag?
Oh, we're trying to get through this heel flap so we can get back to the heel turn. Trying to knit as fast as possible. Hello from East Alberta. Hello E. Nixon. How is the eastern side of Alberta this morning? Or afternoon, rather. Because somebody asked a little while ago what time was it in Canada, and unfortunately Canada is big enough. We've got a few time zones, but here in here in Alberta it's uh, 3.18 p.m. Three eighteen p.m. and I admit I am trying to get my sleep sped, sleep schedule back on track because one of the husbeast's co-workers mentioned a British TV show that is in its sixth season, I think, called Line of Duty, and we've been watching it. And the writers are real jerks. And I say that the writers are real jerks because they have written each episode in such a way that if you have the opportunity to binge watch this thing, you will. Because it's like, you know, everything ends on a cliffhanger or some piece of information that you want to know more about. And yeah. We wound up binging something like two seasons within two days. That's not healthy. Granted, those seasons were about six episodes each, but still, that's still about six hours. <laughs> uh, kind of a grab bag. Those are leftovers, which they sold cheaper. 15 euros for five balls is a nice deal. Ooh, that's nice. Now, is that from an independent dyer, or was that from... I'm going to cough. There we go. Oh. Beginning to wonder if maybe next time I should just stick with water rather than tea because wow. Uh, let's see here. My town did not get snow, but parts of Edmonton had four to six inches. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about that a little bit earlier. <clears throat> I sympathize with the folks of Edmonton who had to shovel their had to brush their walks this morning. What plural do you use? I was about to write a chat with y'all, but realized that might be a bit out of place here. Hmm, not terribly. Not terribly. Sick. There we go. Um, people use y'all out here. Folks. Folks is one of the terms that I use the most. You lot. You guys. T. 
two inches of rain, oh no. Rain is not great. Although, rain does make the flowers grow and we were very happy that we found, finally saw some buds on our apple tree. <clears throat> Normal big online craft store from Germany. I don't know many indie dyers or sellers here in Austria. Fair enough. Fair enough. I've seen... I think there's... I think there's a couple of dyers in the UK that have podcasts and stuff that I'd like to try their stuff out sometime. <clears throat> Just can't remember their names off the top of my head right now. My mum and I went to our big craft store here in Calgary. Uh, we went to Michael's this past week. We were out and about for other reasons, and on the way home we stopped in at Michael's because I wanted to get myself... I think I left it out in the other room. I think I left it in the sewing area. <clears throat> I wanted to get something with which I could floss the corset and wanted to get... wanted to get some ribbon just in case. I haven't yet found the kind of lace that I would like to trim the corset with, so it may not actually get lace. Or I may break down and make lace. We'll see. It would have to be in maybe maybe beige or a crew because I can't see myself uh, knitting or I can't see myself knitting or crocheting black. Although I do have some really nice uh, lace weight yarn that might make some good uh, <clears throat> might make some good uh, trim. Farm country rain is essential if you like to eat. Yes, most definitely. But yeah, we walked into Michael's and there was this huge sale going on. I just lost my music, which means my cord came unplugged. <clears throat> I am a huge believer in command strips. Much to the Hus Beast's bemusement, so I have command strips all over the place here doing things like holding up pieces of my other headset. My other headset's cute. I just didn't think that uh, kitty cat ears were uh, the thing. It's more of a gamer headset. <clears throat> Pardon me. But yes, Michael's had this huge sale, and I have been needing rulers for quite a while. And I still need to, I still need to get myself a good, um, it's the French curve, the large French curve that you use for pattern making. I need to get myself one of those. Mum gave me hers, but it's so old, the poor thing is falling apart. And in the meantime, though, I walked away with, I think, I think it might be Prim, um, one long ruler that's, I think, 3 by 12 or something like that, or 3 by 24, and one large square ruler, 
which is probably about a good 10 to 10 to 12 I think it's a 12 by 12 uh, inch ruler and yeah um, normally those would have cost probably about 30 bucks each and I got one for ten dollars and one for fifteen dollars so I think in grand total with with the ribbon and the with the ribbon and the floss and the rulers everything came out to maybe 40 bucks which was pretty awesome nearly all of our apple pear cherry and plum trees have already bloomed but it was really late this year yeah uh because of the hail damage that we sustained last year like we we for anybody who is unaware uh, I've tried to I've tried to mention it in uh, or I have mentioned it in previous uh, stream and videos we had a huge hailstorm last year it seems that every couple of years we get we get hail to a greater or lesser extent and it turns out that <sighs> here's the thing I moved out here from Toronto. Toronto gets rain. Toronto gets muggy weather. Toronto gets sweltering weather. I have been in the position where <clears throat> I was overheating to the point where we had to go into a building and find a lady's room so that I could splash cold water on my face because I, I literally could not see. I blacked. I was conscious, but I couldn't see. I'd blacked out. And luckily enough, I was walking with somebody who was, we were in front of a hospital of all places. Just coincidentally, that's where the bus stop was. And they guided me inside and popped me into the ladies room. And about the time that the uh, air conditioning came on, everything started to clear up. And the only other time I'd really had that happen where I lost the ability to see was when I was stuck in a large well I was stuck in a dark room with a large amount of people because I went to art college and you take photography <laughs> and it looks like you stuff enough people into a dark room it gets rather warm and I guess It got warm enough that I started to black, started to go to black. And uh, yeah, um, out here I've not had that experience. I haven't had the experience where everything sort of shuts down and I have to get someplace cold. But this place has hail. So it used to be when I was living in Toronto, I would, if I needed something from the corner store, I'd just walk. I'd go, I'd walk. And when I moved out here, it was kind of weird because I would start walking to the store and this is even at my parents' place, which is a couple of communities south of me. I'd start walking to the grocery, I'd start walking to the store and all of a sudden you'd start feeling these little pellets from the sky. And next thing you know, you were feeling a lot of heavier pellets from the sky. And having an umbrella just destroys the umbrella. So you wind up driving a lot of places because you never know when a hailstorm's going to come up. You would think that they would be predictable, but no. You could have a beautiful, bright, sunny day, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, over comes a big black uh, cloud, and boom, down comes the hail. It is really, really weird how fast hail seems to accumulate out here. And on more than one occasion, we've wound up uh, driving in the west side of town over by, uh, it's the largest hill before you actually reach like the foothills area. So it's the largest hill in town, Nose Hill. There have been a couple of times when we've been driving around the perimeter of Nose Hill and just out of nowhere, boom, big thunderstorm, lots of hail. So last year, 
when uh, the big storm happened in our area because apparently our area is one of the areas that gets hit the worst. And we wound up, we were, we were going for dinner. My mother-in-law had requested Indian food and we were going to a place downtown that's owned by friends of the family to pick it up. And just, it started raining. And we were like, huh, that's weird. By the time the husbeast went in to pick up our curries and, and butter chicken, it was coming down like cats and dogs. And we tried to get back up to the northwest to, to the mother-in-law's house. And everything kept veering us over to the east side. So you'd try to go north and it would it would detour you east. You'd try to get back to a western route, it would detour you east. And finally we just sort of went, you know what? Something wants us to go home. <laughs> Don't know what it is, but it wants us to go home. And so that's what we did. We we um I'm closing Discord. It just keeps on distracting me. <clears throat> but that's what we did. We wound up heading back towards our house. And, um, yeah. It had hailed. It had hailed like nobody's business. And we came up one area and realized that if we were going to try and get back to the other side of the airport we would need a submarine because there's a tunnel that goes underneath uh, one of the runways at the airport to get you from one side of the city to the other and you yeah, know it was it was underwater uh, just getting back to our house there were some pretty huge puddles that I was really really glad that I drive a crossover that's a little higher up from the ground and yeah um, by the time we reached our immediate neighborhood the hill that had come down had accumulated like snow there were neighbors outside with shovels shoveling the walks um, the folks who would normally shovel their walks into the street were helping people who were motor were helping motorists actually shovel their cars out so that they could get down the street and around the corner. Um, I remember that there were some nice folks actually helping direct traffic around the corner because for whatever reason there was a lot of traffic and so you had people wanting to go straight through and people wanting to turn the corner and the people turning the corner were just stacking up and you didn't want to cause any kind of accident because there were some people behind who were frankly impatient. We saw a few people doing some pretty pretty bad driving practices that day thinking that because they were in a 4 by 4 or something that they could get away with it so we were really really happy for our neighbors who were helping rock people out of ruts of hail who were helping direct people around the corner some folks wading in these puddles up over their knees um yeah and when we got back to the house it was totally trashed like there was damage on all four sides of the house Luckily, we didn't lose any windows. <laughs> we were really, really lucky. Uh, almost every single neighbor lost windows. We didn't. But our siding was trashed. The fences in the backyard are trashed. Um, and they'll eventually need replacement, but insurance wasn't willing to cover any of it. The deck is pretty trashed. It's going to need replacement in the next couple of years, I think. We had to replace the roof. Now, bearing in mind, we had another hailstorm about two, three years previous. So within the past five years, we had had another storm and had had the siding on at least 
two sides of our house replaced and the roof replaced. So now last year we were in the position where we had to do the same thing all over again. And uh, we were very lucky. We had the opportunity to upgrade the materials that we were using. I thought I closed Discord. Why is it still hooting at me? We, we had the opportunity to upgrade the materials. So now the roof is this sort of rubber slate thing. Um, I think it's called Euro Shield or Euro, Euro Guard or something. Where it looks like a slate roof, but it's actually a rather thick rubber. So that if hail impacts on it, it should just bounce right off. So I, I guess I'll feel bad if something imp you know, ricochets off our roof and takes out the neighbor's window, but on the other hand, I'll be happy to not have to replace the roof again. And the um, siding is now made from hardy board, which is, I think, a kind of lightweight concrete. So it's it's not the tissue thin, um, it's not the tissue thin vinyl siding any longer. The hailstorm was like one of those kind of storm of a century type things. And driving through our neighborhood afterwards, like even just taking a walk through the neighborhood afterwards, was was like looking at a disaster area. And we're starting finally to see our provincial government or at least the city government, somebody is is looking to maybe give us some assistance with the uh, upgrades that are necessary for our area but on the whole the province basically went well unless you had water damage in your basement or something we don't really care and that was really difficult to deal with because you had no real assistance, no real disaster assistance, which I guess after the flood a few years back, because the Bow River flooded, and then uh, Fort McMurray, I believe it was, uh, had a huge fire. <laughs> we've seen fire and we've seen rain, as the song goes. <laughs> wasn't pleasant. <laughs> I, I think our disaster recovery funds are at an all-time low and hopefully touch wood or at least metal bean coated particle board we won't have to deal with it again this year but in the meantime it means that um, we're, we're trying to do the better safe than sorry route for instance uh, I've got to get some plastic bins to put family heir uh, well not heirlooms but keepsakes into because we've got some family photographs that if they're not going up on a wall they should probably be protected rather than being in a cardboard box because it doesn't matter where you put it in the house we now know things might not be safe uh, getting hailstorms here more and more often they're frustrating when you have a farm or a garden extremely destructive yeah so we're finally starting to see some buds on the apple tree in the front yard. I haven't checked the lilac in the back. The lilac is usually my favorite uh, shrub to watch because I just adore the color and the scent. And everything has been so barren in our garden the past this this uh, this spring that you wouldn't think that it was spring at all uh, we're only just starting to see some of our bulb plants come up so I think there's some tulips in the front near where the apple tree is that are just starting to come into bloom <laughs> and it feels weird because it's the middle of May and that stuff should have been blooming you know at least half a month ago so I don't know what's going on with with our weather and uh, and such but if you know if our trees just need a year to uh, 
hibernate and recuperate, then I'm all for it. If I have to take out the trees because for whatever reason, uh, due to the hail damage, they've, um, you know, they've sustained so much damage that they need to come out. Well, I'll, I'll not be happy about it, but I'll do it. Here's hoping, though, that they just need a little bit of time to, to rest and recuperate. And we might, uh, we might not get any apples this year, but if we don't have to worry about the, uh, the trees in the backyard sending out uh, suckers or trying to uh, propagate themselves in the rest of the garden, I guess I'll be happy. Alrighty, I am going to knit across and then I am going to see how many rows I've got here. Because I kind of got talking and forgot to knit while I was talking. Beginning to think I should have started the hill flap before the stream. Instead, what I did, because I wanted to be able to show the turning of the heel on stream, I had uh, started another pair of socks for my dad because I'm just going to say it. The man's feet are so big that I have to start earlier and earlier in the year to make him his Christmas socks. Okay, where are we? Two, four, six, that. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six. Not bad. Not bad at all. So this is going to be twenty-eight. So I think I've only got about two more back and forths that I need to do. And then we can turn the heel. The hard part is going to be the picking up of stitches. I might have to take off my glasses for that. Because I'm going to have to get up close and personal with them. So what are you guys all up to while I'm working on these last two sets? Hello, Orange W. Still haven't finger finished a single motif. Oh no.
putting metal shelving together. Just doing my first peasant hills, but I'm settling in for bed now. I keep forgetting that in Europe it's like nighttime. Catching up on email while one of our guinea pigs has floor time in the kitchen. Aw, yay, guinea pigs. And having multiples, like at least two, I gather from the plural there, having plural guinea pigs, I take it that you get to hear the, uh, the sound of the guinea pig, the song of the guinea pig fairly often. A friend of mine does or did guinea pig rescue and I remember we went over to their place once and they had a room plus some sort of set aside trail area for the guinea pig. Guinea pigs. And all you could hear were these really cool noises that were kind of like sonic Phew! Phew! They make very unique noises, I'll just say. Working on the bottom ribbing of the body of the sweater I'm making. Yay, ribbing! Yay for remembering your knits and your pearls. <laughs> the sweet sound of the vegetable drawer. The Husbeast grew up with rabbits. So we tend to uh, see quite a bit of rabbit YouTube. And the vegetable drawer is a thing. Thirty. This is the last one. Okay. So... For those of you who are not sock knitters, this is the last, last row of the heel flap. Yay! And then we'll go back to turning the heel, which is what we started off doing without a heel flap. That was a bad idea. So now we're going to do the whole knit to the middle and then a couple after. Let's make sure we've got 16 on each side. 2, 4, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Good. Okay, so we want to have 12 on each side and work across the stuff in the middle, taking bits from each side as we go. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. I've got four stitches to work with there. One. Uh, yeah. So knit one, knit two together, knit one, and we're at two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Good. And we go back. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So knit four and then reduce. Two, three, four. Pearl, I mean. 
slip two, purl two together through back loops, purl one. You should have 12, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, good. And then like we were doing at the very beginning of the stream, if you didn't tune in at that point, we're going to knit till one stitch before the gap. There we go. And knit two together. And knit one. Turn, slip one, purl back to one before the gap. Slip two, purl together through back loop, and purl one. Turn and repeat. Uh, let's see, Abby Brosnan says, it's great, the, it's the Alaska sweater by Camille Descuneau. And it's supposed to be a cropped sweater, but I have a specific hatred for cropped sweaters, so I knit the body longer. Fair enough. Wish I was knitting along. I always get a hole at the ankle. Uh, is that the hole at the top of the gusset? Because that happens. It's it's normal. I will try to show how you can uh, minimize the hole at the top of the gusset. It happens. If you are not a sock knitter, you will know what I am speaking of when I am done. Now this, this is just a really, really simple heel. Like it's like probably the most basic of basic heels. Um, you can, you can get more, uh, you can tailor it pretty much however you like. The reason being that some heels fit people better than others, depending, uh, on whether they like their heel to be a little shallower, whether they like it to be a little bit more rounded. It's where you pick up the stitches along the instep. Yeah, yeah. I'll show you a trick for that. I just need to finish turning the heel. As I've said before, my mom told me that this was probably the hardest part of, of doing a sock, and really it's not all that hard at all. It's just a matter of practice, really. And the picking up of stitches, I actually use a technique. Um, I'll try to remember to put it into the notes for later reference if you want to come back to the... If you want to come back to about this place in the recording later on because I will be keeping up I will I do keep the live streams up because people do want to be able to see them because I haven't been able to participate personally or because you know for whatever reason listening to people chatter away is is a thing <laughs> I'm not going to say no to it um, but I'll try to remember to put a link in the uh, in the notes at the bottom or the description there's a couple of YouTube um, a couple of YouTube videos that show a better way to pick up the stitch stitches across the sides of the 
heel flat. And eventually I will, hopefully, once uh, either I am gainfully employed or the channel is earning enough in royalties from YouTube or what have you, someday I will upgrade the camera that's hovering above and get something with a zoom lens. And that way, hopefully, I'll be able to adjust in on what I'm doing a little bit better. Goodness, Abby, you've got color work and underestimated the amount of yarn. Oof. I have to admit, when I was getting the yarn for the sweater that I'm working on, sort of lackadaisically, on my own time, um, I was very happy that Knit Picks had a yarn calculator for that pattern. So it would be able to tell me how many balls of yarn I would need because otherwise I would have been sunk. And I was surprised that the amount of yarn was not too terribly prohibitive. Because when you're looking at plus size patterns, you're kind of looking at a prohibitive amount of yarn. <laughs> like pricey, rather pricey. And this was actually pretty affordable if if I wasn't doing it in collaboration. Knit through the back loops of the stitches, picked up the side of the heel flaps. I'm doing it as a faff, but I prefer how it turns out. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to just eh, put that back. Okay, so for those new to sock knitting, pardon me while I scratch an itch. We have the heel flap, which is that flappy thing, and then we have turned the heel, which means that we have made a little cup into which your heel can sit. So I'm, I'm hoping that makes sense to somebody who is not an, a natural sock knitter. So that is what the back of your foot would look like. So now what we're going to do, I am actually going to divide my stitches again so that instead of everything being like, ah, come back here. Instead of everything being like this, we are going to get the needles to go 90 degrees the other direction. So. Got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen stitches. So two, four, six, eight, nine is where we're going to pull that through. And now two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen is the middle there. So I'm just going to Pull that up and make sure again. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Yes. Just going to move those stitches out of the way and boop. All right. Just 
going to get rid of these. All right. So now when I take a look at it, there we go. We are now ready to pick up the, uh, the stitches for the gusset and start working across. This is why when I said that I had le left this after a purling row, like a row with pearls on it, so that I could just knit straight across, that's why I wanted to do that. And then I'll just pick back up and pattern. So. Across we go. We'll do our nine stitches. Okay. I'm turning this so that I can see the inside of the sock. Now, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this very well. Let me just pull this, pull this down maybe. Ha <laughs> ha, there we go. Getting up close and personal with my sock. <laughs> okay. That light's really not doing us any kind of favors on the sock itself, is it? Now. The thing that you notice when you take a look at the internals of the sock. You see how you've got your little V. Uh, that does not look very good, does it? There we go. You have the little V shape at the bottom, okay? There is, tucked in there, both of the strands from that V, tucked in at the bottom. You want the one that, let me try something here. I might not be very well lit, but hopefully the rest of the screen will be. There we go. All right. So, because I was slipping the last stitch and then knitting it on the way back, we've got these sort of loose V's on the edge on both sides. As the, as Strong Bad would say, consummate V's. So, when you take a look at where those V's go into the top of the next stitch, you wind up with, I'll go back up to this one, you end up with this sort of two, two little bars. You want the one right here that actually controls this outside V, outside part of the stitch. But you want to do it, as I said, on the inside So I'm going to start picking these up and I hope that you will be able to see what I'm doing. So there we go, there's the first one. Second. Third. This really does help if you have a kind of yarn that you can actually see, like if there's a if it's a variegated or hand-painted yarn where you can kind of determine which part of the loop is which. A 
<laughs> As who would say strong uh, consummate Vs? That That is strong bad, if I'm not mistaken. Um, look, look up Trogdor the Dragon sometime. Uh, it, it's from the early, early days. Uh, it's, it's a meme from the early days of YouTube, of, um, internet animation. Looks like it may be the other side of the sock that I'll have to take my glasses off for. So I'm actually doing pretty good here. The other side of the sock is also the harder side of the sock. At least that's what I find. And some of these wind up getting kind of mushed together because the stitches get really, really small, in fact. Okay, so you're picking up the outside part of the V through the inside part. Exactly. Exactly. Is what I'm doing is finding where they are on the inside of the sock at the top of where they go into the next stitch, the stitch below it. And then I'm picking up that the uh, the strand that controls the outside of that uh, of that stitch. So what you wind up having when you're done is this really nice nice tight pickup rather than having something that's kind of floppy. Cuz nobody likes a flaccid sock. Try saying that with a straight face. Okay, so I've got how many of these? I've got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen. So I've picked up seventeen stitches. Knit them however you see fit. Some people prefer to knit them through the back loop. I'm okay with knitting them through the front loop. And for this step, slow and steady kind of wins the race. There we go. Well, that's a little bit better. Okay, now you may have noticed there's quite a gap here. And this is where a lot of knitters wind up getting little holes. And the thing is, Nobody needs to know if you have to go back and fix that with a little, you know, just a little, little strand of yarn that you just zip into a circle and go boop. You know, you just take around the edges of it and just go Poof. Nobody needs to know. Who's going to look at the inside of their sock? But the other thing you can do. Uh, I think, is that it? Yeah. What I'm doing is I'm just going to pick up a stitch, twist it, boom. I'm going to find myself a stitch marker.
find myself two stitch markers. Alrighty. First stitch marker goes here. So I should have about 18 stitches plus the nine from the heel turn. So 27, 27 stitches total. And then you just continue on. And as I said, because I, I made it so that I could just knit across the top of the foot, that's all we're doing. It's just knitting across the top of the foot. You might be noticing that things look a little bit tight in my hands and that is because, yeah, you've got a lot of stitches in a small amount of place right there. We're going to do it again over here. So. This is what that one half of the sock looks like. And you'll notice we have a very minimal hole over here. This side of the sock is harder. <laughs> it's not as easy. So. We are going to knit across to the gap. Oops. Here's our rather sizable gap. So I am not going to worry about closing that gap quite yet. First I want to get all of the stitches onto a needle. And as you can see it's a little harder to make out like you can see your, your consummate V's, but it's a little harder to get in there. So you may find it's easier to work with this needle. You may find it's easier to work with this needle, but you just do the best that you can to try to pick up what you can. And I usually wind up going for the most recognizable bar that I can find there. Give me one second. I need to take a close look. that I can do here. So what I'm doing, and I don't know if you can see it, if it's, if it's actually focusing in on it, is you can actually at the top of where the two stitches, where the, where the top and the bottom stitch meet, you can see a little bar there. So you just pick up the little bar as best as you can. Now we get down towards the bottom and you wind up having some longer stitches. And if I recall correctly, I also missed a stitch. So I'm going to pick one up in here. Come hither. You'll do.
another stitch. There we go. So I've got my nine and then two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. I've already got 18 on there. I'm not gonna worry about it. I could, but that wouldn't net me anything. So we, we do still have a gap, that's fine. I actually find that it helps to actually do this from this side of things. Technically the stitches should be the same amount on both sides, but as long as you're following in pattern and you wind up decreasing to the same amount of stitches eventually, because you can you can always you can always keep decreasing on one side after you finish decreasing on the other. Um is the bar a leg of the stitch below the selvage? Uh, I think it actually might be a top of a stitch. Like uh, you see how on, on your pearl side of things, you've got your little sort of pearl bumps. I think they're like a pearl bump that comes off of there, but it does, it does pick up nice and tight. The main thing is to do it from that back edge. But now what we want to do is we want to close this gap so I find it easier to actually just go down a couple of stitches in the pearl bump side on the back and let's see if I can find one that's good this this looks good right here so it's, it's just a couple of pearl bumps down from one of the stitches and boom picked it up and transfer it over here so that I can put the stitch marker back on. Transfer it back over. And again, either knit through the front or the back loop, whichever one works best for you. Whoops. Left a little bit of my stitch still on there. This is the one that's going to be tight. That's what she said. But again, slow and steady wins the race. If you need to pull it forward to get a little bit of room in there so that you can get your needle in, do it. Alright, now we're back up to our, what, nine stitches? Yeah. And there we 
go. We now have stitches picked up all the way around. We're ready to work on the gusset of the sock and we shouldn't have any holes at the tops of the gaps. Uh, what's the marker for? The marker is just to tell me where the top the uh, top of the foot is and where the bottom is because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sorry we're going to be knitting back in the round again so we're no longer working back and forth we're just going to knit up to three stitches before the marker and we're going to do a decrease. Oh, come on, yarn. Play nice. There we go. Okay, so we're at three stitches before the marker. Knit two together and then knit one. Slip your marker and knit across the top of the foot. Or actually in this case, I'm going to be going in patterns. So one, two, three, purl. Wee, the sound of me hitting my, uh, my armature. Knit three, pearl, knit three, pearl. Note the decrease is because we're working on the gusset. So we've knit all the way across the top. Slide that marker over. Knit one. Then slip, slip, knit. So there's a decrease on that side and then knit all the way to the end of the toe and the next round is just going to be knitting all the way around. Um, do I have a sock down here that I can use as a demonstration? I may. I will get up from my chair in just a moment. So basically what you're going to be doing, and you can see it on some commercial socks, is you're basically going to be knitting a little triangle down the instep of your foot because your foot itself is a tube, if you think about it. 
if you if you bust your uh, body's anatomy down to its basic shapes, you've got. If you're looking at your body in its basic shapes, you've got um, cylinder. Okay, so it's basically a cylinder. You've got cones. You've got. In this case, it, it would be like a, a rectangle or a cube, but if you were covering it with fabric, a tube, so another cylinder. So you're dealing with cylinders here. And to an extent, because your heel juts out the way that it does, it's a it turns this area into a triangle. So what you want to do is you want to be able to start going around in just a tube again to be able to clothe the rest of your foot down to the toe. So what you need to do is you now have to create that triangle here so that basically you're able to go around this way. So because you're going to be going back and forth here, what you wind up doing is filling in this area triangularly. So give me a moment. I am just going to stand up and see if I can find myself a sock over here. I will just very quickly turn off the camera so you don't have to see me getting up and stuff. One sec. Okay, success. I found a sock in need of mending. So if you take a look at what I've got here, this very well-worn area is the heel flap and that is the heel turn that we just worked on. This is the top of the foot and this here is the little triangle that we're working on so that we can get back to working around in this manner. So what we just did was this little area in here with the first little decrease and you'll notice that there's like this little sort of line of decreases. And you'll see that again on the other side and it's running parallel to the top of the foot. I think that's a Stephanie Pearl McPhee pattern that I did. Uh, I think that's her Earl Grey pattern. But the thing to notice with this, and I'll just stick my hand in here, because this was done pretty much the exact same way. The stitches that go down that heel flap are pretty darn tight, so that's not going anywhere anywhere soon. The, the little area at the top of the gusset is looking pretty good. It's pretty tight, not a lot of hole there, and pretty good here. I don't do anything special. A lot of people will say that on your next pass on that uh, slip to and knit through the back loop that you should knit the next one through the back loop. I just don't do that. I just keep going. I just knit it. And yeah, eventually you will get back to the point where you have done all of your decreases. And if you've got more on this side than you do on this side, then you do one more decrease on this side until you're the exact same on both. And you just keep going around in pattern. I'm hoping that makes sense. So on this round, we're just going to knit plain all the way around. Just 
move this up a tiny little bit. There we go. Now I have, I have been very smart in that I very coincidentally chose a pattern that every second round is just a knit plain round so that when I'm knitting plain on my heel or my gusset, I don't have to do anything fancy over the top of the foot either. I can just do one entire round knit plain all the way. And that makes it a lot faster. Because when you don't have to think about a pattern, it makes it extremely easy peasy. And I can't believe that it is 4.30. <laughs> I think that misstep with uh, doing the heel turn early, a little earlier on in our, in our go kind of messed things up. Now, bearing in mind, it took me, what, two hours to basically turn a heel and start in on the gusset? That's with me talking. Now, imagine how fast you could do that with a little bit of practice and not carrying on a conversation or just being able to sit back and listening to a conversation going on around you, which is exactly how I get a lot of this stuff done is because I'll bring my socks with me wherever I'm going. And if I'm sitting at my parents' house and they're having a chat with, you know, the husbeast or a friend of ours who's come along for dinner or what have you, at least during non-pandemic times, um, I can just sort of sit there and knit, and if I want to, I can carry on as part of the conversation the way that I'm doing now, or I can just sit very quietly and work out the kinks on a more complicated step of the process. So anybody who is wondering during the last stream how I get so many socks knit during the year. That's how I do it, but I also don't knit as many socks as some people do. I, uh, I tend to actually be somewhere in the middle. There are some people who right now are doing like the whole, what, 20 socks for 2020 or 20 pairs for 20 or 20, 21 pairs for 2021 since it's now 2021. Okay, so on this round, what will happen is you'll knit up to up to three before the stitch marker again, knit two together, knit one, knit and pattern around the top of the to top of the foot, knit one, knit two together through the back loop, and then continue on, and then just knit one round plain. Boom. So. On the next stream, what I will probably do is I will finish off the gut. I will have finished off the gusset and done the foot and I will walk you through doing the toe. Probably the best way to do it. But watching me doing a doing the gusset of a uh, sock is not exactly exciting. <laughs> probably about as exciting as watching me do a heel flap. Next time I'll remember to, you know, do the heel flap first or something. Put a little video of it in quick time. Double time. For anybody, knit early and often, exactly. Uh, for anybody who's interested, I will very quickly bring out the corset that I'm working on. Actually, I'm going to put that back in here. For anybody who's wondering, 
this is and and wasn't here for last week this is uh knit picks hawthorne sock yarn in the colorway of burlingame which um knit picks provided to me through their uh, we crochet 2021 collaboration or i think it's we crochet collab 2021 as well um if you check out kp collab 2021 on instagram you'll see what other people have been getting uh, and what they've been knitting or crocheting so thought that i would give them a shout out since technically they are sponsoring this video because i'm using yarn that they provided to me for this collaboration which i am really appreciative of because i am loving this sock yarn and i am probably going to either ask for or buy more because i really like it it is soft and it's strong and it's really pretty and i don't say that about a lot of well i go to commercial sock yarns usually for the strength and the durability um this this here was a hand paint and it's really, really soft, but it's also worn through in a few places. I, th I think it's been, I think it's mate has been uh, darned a couple of times and it's just wearing through in places. This is one of the Husbeast socks. And while I love some of these indie hand paint yarns, I think that they actually seem to be a little bit better suited towards shawls and other items, shawls and hats, some mittens that will last a little bit longer, like more than one season, because some of these hand painted yarns, um, God, I got some Koigu, uh, which is a Canadian hand painted yarn. And it's absolutely gorgeous stuff. It's just, I, I spent a lot of time knitting myself a really nice pair of socks. I think it's the Sleepy Hollow socks uh, that have a very similar, I, I used a very similar construction on my Weeping Angel pattern that I made myself or that I designed. And the uh, heel pattern on that is really cool. It is so really cool because you, you basically don't do a heel flap. You just widen things out and then you turn the heel. It's pretty cool. But I think within a couple of wears of the sock, it blew out in the toe. And I was not happy about that because I put so much effort into making this pair of socks. So... When I'm looking at a sock yarn, I'm looking for something that is durable and is strong and is going to last for a few washings because I am the lazy type who would rather just toss the socks in the washing, washing machine and then when they're done their spin cycle, you know, when, when they're done their, their cycle period, uh, fish them out and either put them on blockers in front of the fireplace or just uh, if it's the middle of summer or what have you, put them on a drying rack in an area where things can drip dry, you know, just fine without, you know, ruining a floor. So putting, putting the, uh, putting the drying rack over the linoleum and letting it do its thing overnight. Softness is good. Not having a smell is good because I'm finding that a lot of uh, some of the really commercial yarns out of Europe have, have a... I'd like to say it's a sheepy smell, but it's not really a sheepy smell. It, to me, it smells like garlic. And I don't know whether it's lanolin that is stuck in the yarn or whether it's something they used as a mordant to keep their color, but... There are some yarns that just smell garlicky to me and it gets on my hands and all I can smell for a while is garlic. This has no smell. <laughs> it's soft. 
it's strong it is pretty and uh, I definitely will be using that brand again yay <laughs> And very quickly, because I'm probably not going to be able to get to all of this today, but I do want to get to some of it. This, I'm going to bump up the brightness in here. Ooh! Sun came out. This is the inside of my corset. It looks worse than it is. <laughs> And this is what I have to work on. I have to actually get the top, or the, this is the bottom and the top, of two sides done. I have a needle. I also have some yarn. Or I've got some thread. Though I'm thinking it probably will be a little bit more exciting when I get to flossing the corset, because then you'll actually see some contrast. <laughs> because this is the thread that I'm using and it's kind of black on black. <laughs> and you're probably thinking to yourself, you really didn't think this through now, did you? At which point I, all I can really say is, um, I worked with what I had. <laughs> I went through all of the white twill on the last two, um, on the last two corset mock-ups. I've got a little tiny bit left, but not much. Where are my scissors? Hello? I need scissors that sizz. There we go. Thank you, Serena. I think it looks pretty good too, actually. It, it's only a one layer corset. So. It's only a one layer corset, so it's going to be a little um, Spartan on the inside, not as pretty. If I wanted to, I could probably put a floating lining on it. But. Considering I, I don't think I'm going to be using this for too terribly long before I'm making myself another one. We'll see. Now, some folks are going to tell you that it's best to not have any knots. They're probably right, but I don't care. Why do I not care? Because this is on the inside of the corset where no one's going to see it. And I'd rather th something be nice and strong than... There we go. As long as it's doing its job, I, I really don't have... really don't have any kind of problems. Now, the binding that I'm using is even more twill because when I was when I was cutting this out, um, I found that whatever I'd made with it before, and it was probably, I think it was another corset, I had enough, I, I guess that I'd had enough that there was like a little sort of dog leg of fabric that I had to chop off before placing the rest of the stuff just to even everything out and there we go that, that's nice and secure not the prettiest but it's secure um, so I wound up with like this leftover fabric And the nice thing about leftover fabric is if you need to, if you've 
bunged up one of your corset pieces and you need to recut a piece, you've got something handy. Or in this case, I'm just going to find where the other bound stuff is, if it's on the, on the back end. Yeah, here we go. You'll notice that this is a slightly different binding and this is, this is binding tape. Yeah. So pre-made binding tape like this, which yes, this would have been a nice contrast, but I decided not to go with burgundy for this one. So I had bias tape, but it's not the double-sized bias tape like this. It's, it's a much thinner bias tape. And as a result, people are messaging in Discord. As a result, um, it was a little too thin to put on the top and the bottom edges because you'll notice this is this is a nice binding size and it actually for the most part hits the bottom of the corset lacing or boning channels on the inside so can i take the light down a little bit that might work so yeah, rather rather than uh, use the really, really thin bias tape, I decided what I would do is, I, I'm not even, this wasn't even cut on the bias. It's just cut into strips that would be long enough to go from one side to the other and then turned in on the ends. I really don't think it, makes that much of a difference. As I said, this this isn't a forever corset. It's probably going to get some good use and then get recycled. Probably possibly chopped down if I if I still really like what's going on. Or I will save the uh the innards I I'll, I'll save the outer so that I can, you know, refer to it. But uh, keep the inner guts for the next iteration, whatever that may be. I kind of, I have a little bit of, little bit of envy for some of the gals who are making their quote unquote forever corsets, but, um, This is how we practice, right? By making more and more iterations of things. <laughs> and truth be told, uh, being a person of size who may or may not be losing weight, it's just more practice, right? So by the time I get down to a size that I can maintain and feel and look good, the, the main thing is feeling good because it's kind of nice to be able to go up and down the stairs without your knees hurting. I will uh, hopefully have the... I keep moving this closer to me and farther away from the camera. Uh, I will hopefully be an expert <laughs> at making corsets. I promise that I will only film them if they are spectacular. Because then I, you know, might as well not be a YouTube channel and just be a corset channel. And there is a thimble around here someplace. There you are. You're hiding. Sorry, you probably heard me bump the mic. I can use a thimble. I don't often choose to. I'm just going to take a look at the chat because people have been chatting while I've been face down looking at the interior of a black hole corset. 
let's see do i have an email list to tell us about live streams i just happened into this one i don't but i do try to use the community tab to um I do try to use the community tab to give people at least 24 hours notice. I do try to post up the, uh, do try to post up the thumbnail the day before. Um, to be very, very honest, the past couple of times because I'm, I am the point of contact for the family if anybody needs anything. So I never know. I'm kind of on call. So I never know if I'm going to have to ditch out of a plan at the last minute. So I'm trying to trying to put some kind of boundaries into place so that I can do stuff like this more regularly. And um, if that's the case, then what I may do is probably probably get an email list going on my website and or uh, post there. Post, the, post to the patrons because I feel bad. I did not post to the patrons about this in advance. And I should have. That's bad on me. I apologize if any of my patrons are in the in the audience. Um, I do try to let folks know on Instagram. I have not done the Instagram live thing mostly because I like the fact that on YouTube or Twitch I can do a live and people can come back and watch it later. They they can't participate one-on-one -on -one, but it might encourage them to try making it to the next one. You never know. And if I'm doing something that's vaguely educational they may learn something. And that's always a bonus. So I will take it under advisement to see about a mailing list. I believe they have softwares for that. Uh, I ha used to have a lanyard that said on it, where are my scissors? <laughs> have you seen my scissors? Anybody who's old enough will remember the uh, sort of little lanyard or, or neck doodads that you used to put on your glasses so that you could you know just sort of put your glasses down around your your neck i had a couple of those back in the 80s because you know i was just the hippest kid and um yeah uh they were purely for fashion because i i use these things constantly they never go around my neck <laughs> But the only time I ever really take them off is, you know, sleeping, bathing, being able to see things right, right up close because I need bifocals or progressives. I am embracing my inner senior citizen. Thank you very much. I will be very happy with progressives when that time comes because I believe that seeing is something that we should all be able to do if you're a sighted person, sorry. If you are not a sighted person, then yeah. You do things the best that you can. But in my case, progressives would really help my cause. Wouldn't mind a corset channel. I do adore the yarn work. Well, I adore the yarn work as well. And corset channels do exist, actually. Um, two that I know of. Lucy's Corsetry. And I think, and I may be pronouncing it wrong, Arania. Arania? Arania Black. Uh, she does corset videos and Instagram stuff. So... There are corsetry, corsetry based things out there, but definitely um, I, I have a soft spot for stays and corsets. 
being a super squishy person of size, it's kind of my thing. And because I can't see what I'm doing, I'm probably screwing this up. So <laughs> we'll see. I may wind up having to do even more, more binding later on. But I figured I'd at very least go to the top of the hour, which is in a couple of minutes. But I definitely wanted to get that heel done because it's kind of, it's kind of become an ongoing thing, you know? The ongoing saga of the Hawthorne Socks. Nitpicks didn't realize when they sent her a ball of yarn that they would be getting at least two videos out of it. They say no knots, but I do not care. I do not care either. Let's see. I definitely learned something today and I finally finished one square, so thanks. <laughs> so yay for that. Yay! Yay for finishing one of your crochet motifs. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out now, by crochet motif, does that mean like a granny square or does that mean sort of like a... Um, Is it Moroccan crochet or or design? That more more sculptural looking. Um, there is a more sculptural looking kind of throw or or tapestry ish type thing that you can do with crochet, um, like the hooked on sunshine crochet blanket type deals. Um, I would consider that a kind of motif, motif work as well. Um, or are they multiple things like the hooked on crochet, um, sculptural squares, but just tacked together as if it was like a granny square blanket or throw. It's not specifically a granny, but it's a square. So I, I'd say probably more like the hooked on sunshine type of motifs. Do you have a pattern name? Because I am curious now. It's the kind of thing that I would probably check out. And it is totally on me for Tunisian. I don't know. Tunisian crochet. Would it be Tunisian crochet? Um, Tunisian crochet uses the long hook and keeps live stitches. And I don't think so. Motif is one piece of a modular project. Yeah. Yeah. See, I am still learning much in the way of the crochet verse. Tunisian looks sculptural to me. Well, I'll have to take a look. Uh, Tunisian, as far as I know, if I recall correctly, uses one long hook and leaves some live stitches. So I, I could be wrong. At least I think that's what T, what uh, TL Yarn Crafts was doing. Bunch of the same thing over and over attached after the fact. Yeah, that that works. Uh, I've got a bone that wants to pop out here. Lovely. Even more reason to floss this. I am going to catch stitch you. Because I can. I'm not very good at this hand stitching thing. I'm better at cross stitch, to be honest. Mm. 
Nature rules from drops done in grace to mimic your brother's kitchen tiles. Ooh, that sounds awesome. I am going to have to look up nature rolls from drops. Hooked by Robin is a great channel. I'll take a look. But we are at the top of the hour. It is 5.03 here in Alberta. And I have some family business that I have to get up to this evening, so. I am going to have to skibble, but one thing I am thinking of if people want to continue chitter chattering away is I do have a discord and what I can do is I can put that in the description of the, of the video. Um, probably when I get home and if people would like to continue to chatter we can do so there if you've got any questions and I will probably also send out messages when I am about to go live there if that makes sense I am the one who should be thanking you guys for coming and keeping me company while I was doing stuff. So, let's move that out of the way. So, yes, this was fun. I am enjoying doing the socializing thing um, during streams. And I'm thinking that this is something that will probably, I'm going to try and get it get it to a weekly thing um, we'll see how stuff goes and uh, yeah hopefully I will see you again around this time next week it's fun to hang out and chat with Peter people I agree it is fun to hang out and chat with people so thank you guys for hanging out and chatting with me today and I will hopefully see you next week I will put up a thumbnail the day before, and in the meantime, I will remember to put the Discord link in the description down below. And that way, uh, if you want to wander in and chatter, you can. Um, because of the, way, of the way that Patreon is set up, patrons are probably going to get a little extra bling, like an extra like color or something in the channel to distinguish themselves, but... I am kind of of the belief that you shouldn't have to pay to be able to chat with people. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, just wander on in and uh, say hello, and we'll see y'all there. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.